Hey guys, Gary J here. Today we're looking at a very unique looking black powder rifle to me. And this is, uh, this model is called the uh, Hopkins and Allen Underhammer black powder rifle. Um, and it's, uh, the design, again, is very unique. Uh, you don't see uh, one with that small a breech on it generally or underhammer that much either, I don't think. So we're going to be talking about the advantages of an underhammer and uh, that this is really an incredible, uh, simple design gun that works extremely well. And for you guys that you shoot a lot of black powder, if you don't have an underhammer, uh, believe me, you're missing out on uh, the beauty and uh, the design of these really accurate black powder rifles here. Now, the um, this is an old design, which I, I think they, they had these in the 1800s, mid-1800s and so forth. Uh, the, the under hammer design has been around since uh, the 1740s. So that's not something new, but the under hammer percussion cap, under hammer percussion cap design, that didn't come out into maybe 1835, 1836, according to some sources. Uh, and the reason for that was because a, a man named uh, Mr. Forsythe uh, invented the percussion cap in the uh, 1820s. And by the 1830s, uh, they were using percussion caps. So um, this particular design goes back to the mid-1800s. People were using uh, underhammers in the Civil War, too. But uh, we're going to talk about this particular type of design and why it's such a fantastic uh, black powder rifle. I realize this is not a pretty gun to a lot of people. It's not that pretty to me. It's kind of like one of those uh, cur dogs that's so ugly that it's cute. It, it'll grow on you, believe me. Uh, you really appreciate the simplicity and uh, the uh, versatility of this particular type of uh, black powder rifle. Extremely accurate, very light. If you can see that breech is only one inch and an eighth tall on the height. But it's very stout. Uh, this one... Uh, I had made in 2002, there was a guy that uh, was making barrels. He had bought Douglas Barrel uh, machinery. Douglas Barrel was, was uh, they had stopped making barrels. They were known to have the best barrels. Well, they were one of the companies that had the best, most accurate barrels uh, in uh, the black powder world. And uh, they quit making black powder barrels, so he bought some of their machinery and tooling and stuff to make his barrels. Now, I'm not saying this is a Douglas barrel, but I'm just that he used the same tooling stuff and machinery, which I used to work in machine shop once upon a time way, way back. So I know a little bit about that, but he was uh, centered on making some really high quality uh, black powder uh, barrels. And he eventually sold them, I think, to CVA and other companies and so forth, uh, the barrels that he was making. But him and some other guys had this venture to make these particular rifles. They, those people, uh, from my understanding, uh, shot these and designed them and made them, uh, you know, to their specifications, but tried to be accurate with history to a certain point. And so they turned out wonderfully, I think. So we're going to be looking at uh, the advantages of having uh, this particular style. Now... One, they're very accurate, okay? Uh, Two-inch group at 100 yards is uh, is reasonable with these type of uh, rifles here. And if you look at 1,000-yard competition, 1,000-yard competitions, a lot of them are shot with the underhammer design. So there's nothing wrong with this design. Uh, they're pretty light. As you can see, the size of that uh, breech there is, again, inch and eighth tall. And it only has two moving parts on it. It's another great advantage. And I'll show you that. Uh, we'll put it on the table and let you see it. 
uh, you get various barrels for these too, from a 32 caliber, 36 caliber, 45, 50, 54, 58, 62, 68, I mean 66 caliber barrels. So you can interchange the barrels on these very easily. It's got three set screws for that. This particular design is ambidextrous too because the lock is underneath it. So a right-handed person or left-handed person has no problem shooting this. And that's another great advantage to the under hammer. Another thing too is that uh, when you shoot these, instead of the hammer being on top and all, uh, you don't have that smoke cloud like you normally do with uh, those that have the lock on top with the hammer and so forth. So you don't have to worry about your eyes because this is underneath. You don't have to worry about a, you know, a certain amount of smoke coming from the percussion or whatever system you got there. Uh, and so that's another great advantage of this. You can see generally after you shoot uh, your target, whether you hit it or not, instead of waiting until the smoke clears. So that's another great thing about these. You don't have that smoke blindness. And uh, that nipple on the bottom there, the powder goes right behind that nipple. So that's an inline charge. That uh, When that hammer hits the nipple, it, push it, it, it ignites the nipple and the fire shoots straight into your powder charge. On the other types where you have your hammer on top of the gun, those type of lock system, when they hit the nipple, the flames go down and make a 90 degree turn to hit the powder charge. This does not do that. It's a straight in line system right into the powder charge. Can't get any better than that. Uh, the ones with, you know, the um, hammer on top of the gun, that 90 degree, sometimes they get stopped up. Now, these can get stopped up too. You just, you know, they're easier to clean out quicker too, I think. That's another great advantage. Uh, you put your uh, percussion cap on there, and they actually, you get the right one, 10 or 11 size, or however you want to, whichever one fits the best on this, and just put those on tight. You don't have to worry about them falling off. And another thing, too, this is, uh, when I had this barrel made right here, uh, I've had it made 31 and a half inches. That's about all you really need to burn all the powder out uh, on a 45. Cause I wanted 45. That's a 166 twist on this one. So it shoots balls. It will also shoot conicals pretty good too with right powder load and right conicals. Uh, so that's the advantage. Now if you're shooting game with this, you would uh, want to harden your lead balls a little more uh, instead of just using pure lead or something like that. Uh, there's probably a couple of other things we probably could say about this right here. Um, but that's some of the main things there I just mentioned. And if you listen to that again, what I just said on the, uh, uh, the uniqueness of this, it's a lightweight gun pretty much if you don't get a real long barrel on it. Um, maybe a carbine link type barrel. It's like a squirrel gun. You can carry it around all day. So it's just very versatile in so many different calibers and again, easy to change the barrel out. So we'll put it on the table and let you see it and uh, give you some idea how this works. Uh, very simple design that's very accurate. And I mean, this gun is so underestimated probably by many people in the black powder world because it just looks odd. It doesn't look like a Pennsylvania or Kentucky and long rifle. Uh, and it doesn't look like a Plains rifle or Hawkins. And so people look at it and say, it's just weird looking. Uh, some people say, this is not a traditional uh, rifle here. Well, this is a traditional uh, rifle here, uh, probably as traditional as you get, especially on the lock system uh, with this percussion cap system. Um, the historians say that that was American bred and born here. And the simplicity of this, I'll show you, uh, made it, it's a lot easier to make and a lot simpler to make than the uh, other lock system that you see on top of a gun. Uh, this is just an ingenious idea here. So that's supposed to, according to them, be American made. And I know the under hammers came back, well, they go back to the 1700s. 
So, uh, but the percussion cap one, that's the, what's unique about this. Uh, again, that came out in the 1830s when the percussion cap was made in, the, I think, the late 1820s by Mr. Forsythe. So we'll look at this and take it apart and let you see uh, how this thing works. I thought while it is assembled here, uh, I put a patch lock on it and I stained the wood on it. Come in, it came in a kit form and I blued it with a plum blue uh, to make it look older. And uh, we'll look at this in detail, but uh, the wooden four-end four in stock. And I've seen people replace these stocks with beautiful maple uh, wood and, and with stripes in it and all that stuff and just really incredible but uh, looking at uh, this breech right here look at my finger this thing is only like less than two fingers wide so this is just so tiny right here but it's very functional okay guys we've got her on the table here now another look at this breech here, I got two fingers on here. It's barely two fingers wide. It's a little less than two fingers wide. This is some heavy, thick steel right here, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, several things we can look at. Looking at the breech here, these are not dials. These are bolts. Uh, these two bolts right here. This bolt holds the trigger sear this bolt holds the hammer sear okay you may ask well where's the spring to this thing because you got to have a spring for that hammer right well the trigger guard here is the spring this is a flat spring a big flat spring and i think you can see that the spring goes about halfway into the trigger guard well, actually, it don't go in that far. It, it's got it's cut out in the center a little bit, and it goes about one third way into the hammer, and then this is just it's the other side that kind of holds it in place. Um, so uh, that's ingeniously made. So you know, basically, you got two moving parts in this: a trigger and a hammer sear, and they're they're held together right here. There's a little spring in here. Uh, that goes straight up uh, that puts a little pressure on this uh, trigger and you got this big spring here uh, which pushes your your hammer forward and, it, and this thing will come all the way back now there's a lot of pressure on that hammer right there but you can pull it back and it'll cock once and when it cock once it'll it will keep pressure off of the uh, nipple and you can pull it all the way back and it will uh, be locked. So the neat thing about uh, this particular sear here on the uh, hammer is that it will keep the hammer off the nipple. Uh, so if you drop it, it's not going to go off. And also you can pull it all the way back uh, and lock it uh, for when you get ready to shoot. Again, this is a 45 caliber. Now, you see right here is a set screw. And on top of it is a set screw. And on this side is a set screw. It's got three set screws. Use an Allen wrench uh, to take these set screws out. You don't even have to take them all the way out. You just have to take pressure off of the uh, plug on the on the rear of the barrel here because this these three screws hold this barrel onto the breech okay now let me tell you one thing that uh, I have not heard anybody ever talk about I, I don't hear people talk I, I've looked at YouTube videos on these guns and they don't really get into them a whole lot talking about them. and that's one of the reasons I wanted to make a video on uh, this type of uh, on the hammer design which I think is really incredible um, what, when you take the barrel off of these, 
you need to uh, take a marker or something and, and make a line uh, on the barrel and on the breech here, okay? Uh, you got to mark that somehow or another. And the reason, you, you want a thin line too. You don't want one too thick and you don't want one that's coming off. You might even think of a metal scribe at the bottom or, or somewhere. The reason that you want a line going from the barrel to uh, the uh, breech here is because when you take this barrel off, uh, the, the uh, plug, the breech plug on the back of this barrel, that plug uh, is round. So I could put the barrel back on upside down. I could put the barrel back on and the sight would be here at a 45 degree. So, of course, it wouldn't shoot that way because the barrel is drilled uh, for the nipple. So this nipple's in the barrel, right? So you've got to put the barrel back on and line it up. And I hadn't heard anybody really talk about that. But the barrel has to be put back on here. And if you've got a line marked on here, the barrel and the breech, then that way when you put the barrel back on, you just line those two lines up. And that way you know that your hammer is going to be hitting the center of the nipple, right? Now, you you can't tell it probably, but the this is the safe mode right here. This hammer is not hitting the nipple. Now, when I pull the trigger... That's what you know, that's when it goes off, okay? So this trigger has got about three and a half pound pull on it. Some people complain about some of these don't have the, the trigger pulls too hard. There's nothing like a hard trigger pull on black powder. So anyway, that's bad to me, but I like three and a half pound is really good on this, okay? It doesn't pull you off. So if you don't have this barrel lined up, the hammer is not going to hit the center of the nipple. Okay, so that's why if you take the barrel off, you, know, you can take that corner line right there on that octagon barrel and uh, just line it, uh, make a mark here on on the inside part right here of the uh, uh, well, the bottom part of this uh, breech here, and so you can line it up perfectly. Some of these have tang sights on the rear back here. And if you got a tang sight back here, it is critical, critical that you have that barrel lined up perfectly if you're using tang sights back here. Okay? And you can be a tad off maybe with this uh, using these iron sights. Now, I love these iron sights right here. These are the old style iron sights, and uh, they are amazing to me. You can see so well in these iron sights. And this front sight right here is really sweet too. Dovetail, so you can push it to the side. And I'm trying not to make a long video. I had the worst problem in the world when it comes to making videos. And there's just so much to know about these right here. And I'll see if you can. That's Hopkins Allen Arms, okay. And the barrel maker that I had make this barrel, he's back in 2002. Uh, he did a great job on it. But this is a plum brown, which I blued this, this plum brown and the receiver plum brown because I want it to look old and I stain it this color to try to make it look older a little bit. So that's the reason for the color. All right. I told you a lot about the gun itself uh, earlier in the video. Now, uh, just want to show you how to take this thing apart, okay?